Now this episode of Pokemon is a cliffhanger episode, which means that as soon as things start to get good, we're going to get hit by- No, 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 not here as well. No, thank you. Stop this. This is bollocks. None of that. Oi, I'm saying no. Stop it. Yeah, basically it's one of those episodes. Great. We start the episode with Ash and his friends on a ferry headed for Cinnabar Island, and Ash says as soon as he gets there, he's heading straight to the gym. It's about time, mate. Your last badge was the Soul Badge, and you got that 26 episodes ago. Pull your finger out, mate. At this rate, you're gonna miss the Pokemon League. Oh, look, Gary Gary's here. Bloody hell, it's been so long since we've seen him. There are probably people watching this that don't understand that reference. We get this quote from Gary Gary. Don't worry, girls. You'll all get a chance to take a picture with me. Yes, because of course, there's nothing an adult woman would would like more than a photo with a 10 year old. Hmm, bit grim. According to Gary Gary, Cinnabar Island doesn't even have a Pokemon gym and Pokemon trainers haven't gone there for years because it's literally just a resort. This is the Pokemon world, mate. Surely there are Pokemon trainers in every location you could possibly go to. Like, do Pokemon trainers not go to resorts? But wait, Gary, you're a Pokemon trainer and you're literally on your way to the resort, are you not? This kid's making no sense. Also, if it's such common knowledge that there's nothing of interest there for Pokemon trainers, even though Gary Gary is going there and he's a Pokemon trainer, then why did Brock not know about this when he was telling Ash and Misty all about the wonders that are at Cinnabar Island? Brock, mate, you really need to update your A to Z guide to Kanto, mate. But wait, again, Brock and Misty are literally gym leaders, officially recognized by the Pokemon League. Do they really not know who their colleagues are? Like, surely if Blaine had stepped down as the leader of the Cinnabar Island gym, like, they'd have been made aware of the vacancy, wouldn't they? That's how it works in every other place I've worked. Okay, okay, I'm overthinking it, but isn't that the point of this series? Oh yeah, and Jigglypuff's here. Let's see if it does anything of note this time. What Pokemon are the blue and green ornaments here meant to be? I've been trying to figure it out for ages. I thought maybe Grimer, but the eyes and the colours are wrong. Like, oh right, technically Shiny Grimer is green, but they're certainly not blue at any point. So I thought maybe an Execute with the wrong colouring, but then at the same time, the shape is kind of off for Execute. I've got no idea what they're meant to be. Answers on a postcard. Oh. Oh no, a hippie. The hippie asks Ash and his friends to solve a riddle. What do tourists think is hot and cool? And Ash says if you lie down in front of an open refrigerator and wrap yourself in an electric blanket, you'll be both hot and cool at the same time. Ash, mate, what's wrong with you? Think first. Speak second, mate. Misty correctly guesses that the answer was a hot spring, but then the hippie goes on a massive rant about how tourists have ruined Cinnabar Island. Surely this is all bollocks though, because like I said before, I'm pretty sure Pokemon trainers still do visit tourist spots. Like it seems rare to come across people in this particular world that don't at least have one Pokemon in their possession, which technically makes them a trainer. And surely having a resort on Cinnabar Island would give people more incentive to travel there when they're trying to get their Pokemon badges, right? Because most people would be like, Okay, I'm gonna go get my gym badge from the Cinnabar Island gym, and while I'm there, I'm gonna stop off and relax for a few days in the resort. Long story short, I don't know what this knobhead's worried about. Ash asks the hippie where the gym is, and the hippie gives him another riddle, and explains that it's where you put your glasses. Which turns out to mean in front of your eyes, but when the hippie shows them the gym, it's seemingly on the edge of town with nothing but woods behind it, even though when they were just talking, they were in a high street with massive buildings on either side. It wasn't in front of their eyes then, was it? The hippie tells the gang that Blaine got tired of battling tourists who cared more about postcards and t-shirts than Pokemon and abandoned the gym. Sounds like Blaine threw a massive bitch fit. Surely he could have avoided having to battle random uninterested tourists by just asking the people who challenge him if they were planning to battle in the Pokemon League. Closing the doors to everyone isn't very productive, is it? Now he's not battling anyone, even the ones that care. Hang on, how does the Pokemon League feel about this? Are they still paying Blaine to be a gym leader even though he's literally not taking on any challengers? All those unclaimed volcano badges aren't going to pay for themselves, are they? Ash throws a wobbly because he can't have a gym battle, and rightly so, and all the hippie can do is offer him his business card. The card shows that the hippie runs a hotel called the Big Riddle Inn. Very creative there. Misty calls him out for running a hotel when he reckons he hates tourists, and she's absolutely right. The bloke's a massive bloody hypocrite. Acting all high and mighty, but happy to take punters' money. Honestly, the things people will do for money.
Oh, by the way, something you could do for me is just give a little tap on that thumbs up button. Let's get about 5,000 likes on this video and hit subscribe if you're new so you never miss an episode of Pokemon WTF Moments. I really hope you're enjoying it. Before Misty can get her answer about the guy being a hypocrite, he vanishes and Brock asks how he could have disappeared like that. Brock, mate, you're standing about 12 feet from a fence. The guy, when he was stood there, was stood between you and the fence. So in fact, he was even closer to the fence than you are right now. He's probably behind the fence. Is anyone going to check behind the the fence? No? Idiots. All three of them. The gang decide to check out the famous Cinnabar Island Pokemon Research Lab. And when they get there, Ash says, Aw, it's just a bunch of souvenir stands. I mean, are you not seeing the huge building behind the souvenir stands? That I bet my left arm is obviously the Pokemon Research Lab. Well, actually, wait, why your left arm? I'm not going to bet my right arm, am I? There's some things the left arm just can't achieve. Team Rocket have a stall on Cinnabar Island, because of course they do, and Jesse's sad because they haven't sold any cookies. I bet it's because they look like shit. Are they even done? Well, actually, Liam, Jesse isn't making cookies. She's actually making taiyaki, which is a Japanese cake made... I don't care. We're watching the English dub. Shut up. James mentions that they're right near the lab and that it's packed with powerful Pokemon. See, that is the lab. So why did Ash and friends just suddenly decide not to visit? Were they really too lazy to just walk past a few souvenir stands? Clearly Brock wasn't as eager to check it out as he's been making out all episode. Ash and friends head to the local Pokemon Center to see if they can rest there. But because there's so many people sleeping in the lobby of the Pokemon Center, Nurse Joy says it's just too crowded. You can't stay here. Soz, mate. As they're leaving, Brock says he thinks that himself, Ash and Misty were the only only people there that actually had Pokemon. Not being funny, mate, but everybody that was at the Pokemon Center was pretty much wrapped in blankets and getting ready to go to sleep. For all you know, every trainer there could have had Pokeballs with them filled with Pokemon that you couldn't even see, or were waiting for their Pokemon to be returned to them after treatment. I'm just saying, it's a weird assumption to make in the Pokemon world. Also, Misty, with quite a glum tone, says she guesses they could camp out in their sleeping bags again. Oh no! Camp out? in your sleeping bags? You mean the thing you do most nights? Oh, how terrible for you three. And to think you're on a volcanic island, so it'll be lovely and warm. How awful for you. The gang try checking in at each of the local hotels because all of a sudden they've become allergic to camping. I mean, I don't blame them to be fair. Camping does suck, but everywhere's full, so wait. Who's that Pokemon? It's literally a tiger. You remember tiger? Everyone had a tiger on their team. Don't you remember fighting the Elite Four in Gen 1 with all your faves? Charizard, Poliwrath, Executor, Alakazam, Pidgeot, and Tiger? Ash says he's so hungry he could eat a horsey. I get that it's a play on I could eat a horse, but a horsey? Really? Wouldn't be very filling, would it? Our heroes stumble across the hotel that Gary Gary is staying in. And while I'm not going to comment on Hitmonlee and Electabuzz here, because they're just doing their job, they're just trying to entertain, they're not hurting anybody. I am going to call into question these women who are sharing this hotel with Gary Gary. They better be staying in separate rooms, otherwise we might need to give Officer Jenny a call. I do feel a bit bad for Gary Gary though, because spending all his time surrounded by adults and never getting to hang out with people his own age can't be good for him. Gary Gary says he'll give Ash and friends his leftovers if Ash spins around three times and says Pikachu. And without any hesitation, Pikachu spins around and gets ready to say it in Ash's place. Pikachu, mate, have some self respect. Jesus. Gary Gary tells Ash he's never seen anyone so pathetic, and Misty fires back with, Have you tried a mirror? Which has all the energy of, I know you are, but what am I? I'm just saying, as comebacks go, that was shit. As Jigglypuff enters the room that Gary Gary is staying in, Gary Gary says, Great, that must be the entertainment. Wait, so does that mean Hitmonlee and Electabuzz weren't the entertainment? But then why were they all dressed up and playing the shamisen? Oh. Everyone's got their kinks, I suppose. Ash and friends run away before Jigglypuff can sing, and then of course Jigglypuff sings and puts Gary Gary and everybody with him to sleep. Mate, I'm not being funny, but what happened to sing as a move being 55% accurate? When this Jigglypuff uses it, it's always an instant hit. Wait, an instant hit? Maybe Jigglypuff is gonna be a star. Brock suddenly remembers that the card that the hippie gave them was for an inn. Basically the only inn on the island that they hadn't checked for a vacancy at. What I don't get is why wasn't that the first place that they tried? Like sure, later in the day they might have forgotten about the card completely, but when the guy first vanished, why wasn't their thought, hey, let's go check the inn? It's not like they had anything else to do. The card has a riddle on it. If you look near the swing, you'll see my hands, or at least my face. Misty quickly figures out that this means a clock, and then they all notice a building up in the hills that has a clock on the side. 
side. But mate, how is this guy actually putting this riddle on his card as the directions to his inn? You're telling me that this guy expects people to figure out where his place is from that. Bearing in mind, Misty wouldn't have figured out this riddle if they hadn't happened to have been standing in the exact park where that specific swing is. Like if they'd have been in the middle of town, they'd have never found the place. That's just bad business. Maybe that's why he's so bitter about all the tourists, because they visit all the other hotels and not his, because they can't bloody find it. I'll tell you what we found. Our way to round three of G Fuel Code Madness. Thank you again to everybody for all of your orders, all the people that put in cheeky extra orders, because you're naughty, naughty. But hey, you stocked up on G Fuel. Thank you so much. Like, you guys are just the absolute bloody best. I'm drinking my favorite flavor today, Nemesis Tea. I'm really hoping the tubs come back into stock soon so more people can get more of it. Although it is in starter packs at the moment, but get them while they're still there because G Fuel Madness has been crazy and the stock's been going like mad. It's just been unbelievable. Oh, speaking of the best, that's the best one. Nemesis Tea is the best one. And that explains why it's sold out. <laughs> The gang make their way to the Big Riddle Inn, and the hippie offers them free rooms as a reward for solving his riddle. Wait, wait, wait. So not only do you give the directions to your hotel in the form of a riddle that can only be solved if you happen to be in the vicinity of a very specific swing set, but if someone solves the riddle and therefore actually finds your hotel, you reward them with a free room. Again, that's terrible business. How can this man afford to eat if he's giving away his rooms for free? Ash's stomach growls for about the 30th time this episode, and the hippie says he guesses they want dinner too. Ash simply replies, Right. And then we cut to commercial. Wait, was there more to that scene? No? Well, that was just awkward. Nothing. Hey look, it's my favorite thing in the whole anime. It's the Who's That Pokemon Pokemon being a yet to be revealed debuting Pokemon. Spoiling the surprise. You love to see it. We see inside the Pokemon Research Lab where a bunch of fighting type Pokemon are training, but oh wait, my boy's here. He's not even a fighting type, but he's one water stone away from becoming one. And in the meantime, he's gonna try his very bloody best. Looks bloody huge in this scene too. What are they feeding him? Team Rocket show how smart they are. They've waited until they've got the cover of night before attempting their break-in of the Pokemon Research Lab, and then used the loudest method possible to actually break into the lab by throwing bombs at the roof. Might as well have done it when it was still light out, mate. So whoever's at the lab or near it or whatever could have called the police, but instead they've called this guy. Are you telling me there isn't a single Officer Jenny on this whole island? Seems a bit unsafe, especially in a very tourist-heavy locale. Fair play to Team Rocket. They've caught all these Pokemon in a single net through a hole in the lab roof without even leaving the hot air balloon. Say what you want about their methods, but that's just impressive. Especially when you consider that the average combined weight of a Machop, a Machoke, a Hitmonlee, a Hitmonchan, a Primeape, and a Poliwhirl is 533 and a half pounds, or more than 38 stone. That's about 242 kilos for those of you that use kilos. What I'm saying is, it's bloody heavy. Direct quote from the hippie. They're floating away. Mate, they're in a balloon. It's what balloons do. Ash sends Pikachu on Pidgeotto's back to take care of Team Rocket, and Pikachu takes them out with a single Thunderbolt. Pidgeotto, who's in direct contact with Pikachu the whole time, is completely unharmed. Why? Because Poke Physics. Team Rocket instantly drops the net that's filled with Pokemon, and they all land on the roof of the lab. They're really lucky they didn't fall back through the hole in the roof. From the hot air balloon to the ground looks like a good three or four stories high. That would have stung. So Team Rocket are gone, and we still have eight minutes of the episode left. So that's a good sign, right? Maybe something big's gonna happen. As thanks for saving the Pokemon, the hippie tells Ash and friends that Blaine actually built a gym that tourists never see. Not being funny, mate, but you could have easily told them that earlier today when you met them in town. He gave us this whole spiel of, oh, the tourists have ruined the island, Blaine abandoned the gym because of the tourists, but neglected to mention that Blaine abandoned the gym to go and build another one a bit more off the beaten path. This hippie's a dick. Pass it on. After the hippie gives them yet another riddle and explains that the gym is in a place where firefighters would never win, Ash and friends decide to go and relax in the hot springs while they try and figure it out. My question here is, and obviously I know why they've animated it this way for Misty, you know, given her age. And frankly, I'm very glad they've made that decision, given her age. But what I really want to know is do people that go to hot springs or that go to bathhouses, things like that, do they actually sit wrapped in towels whilst they're sat in the water? Like I don't 
don't go to any of these places, so is that a thing? As far as I know, a damp towel against your skin feels bloody horrible. So sitting wrapped in one whilst half my body and the towel is submerged in water sounds like the least relaxing thing ever. So is this a thing? Answers on a postcard. Togepi gets tired of being a boiled egg and gets out of the hot spring and then stumbles across a switch that opens up what appears to be the path to Blaine's secret gym. The path opens up at the back of the hot springs and even collapses the fence that divides the guy's side of the hot spring to the girl's side of the hot spring. Mate, how dangerous is that? Imagine chilling in the hot tub. Five feet apart because they're not gay. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Imagine you're chilling in the hot springs. Fuck, that's an oxymoron. Imagine you're relaxing in the hot springs and all of a sudden big planks of splintered wood just come flying at you because some idiot leaned on a Gyarados statue. Thanks for this. Right, my oh no, my friends have seen me wearing only a towel. Yeah, because that's terrible when arguably they're seeing you more covered up than you were when you literally entered a bikini contest that they attended. How embarrassing! So there are candles in the little alcoves that are lining the walls of this corridor, but they're barely melted. That means they must have been lit very recently. What I'm saying is I'm surprised they didn't run into the person that lit them. It seems like lighting all of them would take a bloody long while. Ash burns his hand on the huge metal doors that turn out to be automatic. Ash, mate, those doors have made you look a right mug. Ash and friends discover that they've actually found Blaine's secret gym, which is hanging above a pool of lava inside a volcano. God, humans in the Pokemon world really are built different, aren't they? Imagine one of us that deep in a volcano. Pretty sure we'd be dead, would we? The hippie turns up and gives them another riddle, the answer to which turns out to be a wig. And Misty says, The only reason you wear a wig is if you already lost your hair. Excuse me, Misty, you uncultured swine. I'm pretty sure my other half would take exception to that. She wears wigs all the time and she definitely hasn't lost her lovely blonde locks. And yes, I know lots of cosplayers wear wigs, but Sophie's my favourite one, so I'm going to use her as the example here. The hippie removes his wig, glasses and moustache to reveal that he is, in fact, Blaine, the Cinnabar Island gym leader. Hang on, this guy is Blaine? This guy is this guy. He looked more like Blaine when he had the disguise on. What's the deal with that? Why did they change him? All right, I've done some digging and it turns out that this design of Blaine is actually the original design of Blaine. But for some reason, very, very late into the development of Pokemon Red and Green, they decided to change Blaine's look completely in the games to the more robotic looking guy that we're all familiar with. So actually this Blaine here is just a really cool callback to Blaine's original character design. And that's pretty rad. Also, this explains why after this episode and the next one, aside from a flashback later this season, we never see Blaine again in the anime. It's obvious that Pokemon would want to use his newer, more official design, but they probably wouldn't want to have to explain why his appearance has so drastically changed. I mean, they could just say he's aged, but then they'd have to explain why Ash hasn't. Blaine accepts Ash's gym challenge and sends out Ninetales, and Ash responds by sending out Squirtle. Oh, can Ash learn in his tight matchups? Bad time, lad, bad time. Blaine tells his Ninetales to to use Fire Spin, and Brock says that's Ninetales' most powerful attack. It's not though, is it? Like, Fire Spin's base power in Gen 1 is 15, and it's only 75% accurate. It can learn Flamethrower, which has 95 base power and is 100% accurate in Gen 1. Sure, in Gen 1, Fire Spin was massively broken and prevented the opponent from doing anything, but at the same time, shut up, Brock, come off it. It's not the most powerful at all. In fact, in a little bit, you're gonna sound like a right mug. Squirtle's Water Gun is too weak to hold back Ninetales' Fire Spin, and as a result, Squirtle gets toasted. It's almost like your Squirtle's weak because you barely fucking train it, Ash. I say this a lot, but Ash needs to train more than just his Pikachu once in a while. Ash sends out Charizard next and Blaine responds by switching out Ninetales for Rhydon. Wait, Rhydon? But he's the fire type gym leader. Like, don't get me wrong, Blaine also doesn't have a Ninetales in Pokemon Red, Green and Blue, but at least it's still a fire type. Like, Rhydon? Really? In every appearance in the games Blaine's ever had, he's never had a Rhydon. Hell, in Pokemon Stadium, he even has a bloody Kangaskhan, but never a Rhydon. I'm sorry, it's just such a random Pokemon for him to have. According to Dexter, Rhydon's large horn gives it formidable attack power. I mean that and the fact he's built like a brick shit house. Charizard buggers off away from the ring to take a nap and therefore forfeits the round and gives the win to ride on. Charizard's a wanker. It's not a WTF moment, I just think he's a bastard. Ash decides his final Pokemon will be Pikachu. I was going to comment that this is super dumb, especially considering Rhydon is a ground and rock type and Ash literally has a four times effective grass type Pokemon in the back, but let's face it. Given Blaine's other Pokemon, there's really no scenario where Ash wins this entire battle. We'd better hope he has some tricks up his sleeve. 
yeah, you know what's coming. Side note, oh, Rhydon only knows Horn Attack and Fury Attack, both normal type moves. What's with anime trainers and having rubbish move sets? Not even a single stab move on this Rhydon. Well, actually, Liam, we only see two of Blaine's Rhydon's moves, so it's possible one of its other moves could have same type attack bonus. Then why don't you bloody use them? Ash tells Pikachu to use Thunderbolt on Rhydon, and as you can imagine, it does nothing, which makes sense because ground-type Pokemon are immune to electric-type attacks. Although, having said that, what happens next makes absolutely no sense. Pikachu! The whole God, I hate this so much. So Pikachu specifically aims its Thunderbolt directly at Rhydon's horn, and that somehow allows it to bypass Rhydon's immunity to Electric-type attacks and deal a shed load of damage. No, 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 no. This is absolute bollocks. How can the writers make this crap up? If you couldn't figure out a way to make it possible for Ash's Pikachu to beat Rhydon within the parameters and the mechanics of the game, why did you choose Rhydon as Blaine's second Pokemon in the first place? You could have made it Arcanine or Ponyta, you know, Pokemon that Blaine actually has in the games. Also, if Rhydon has this particular Achilles heel, surely it would be common knowledge. So why wasn't the Pokedex like, oh, and remember, electric attacks can damage Rhydon, but only if you target its horn. This whole thing is stupid. I hate it. I it's one of the worst things in the old franchise. It's almost as bad as Thunder Armor. Not, not as bad, but quite bad. Oh, and also shout outs to people that quote this scene correctly. You often hear people say, aim for the horn, but the direct quote is actually just, Pikachu, the horn. So Ash's Pikachu knocks out Rhydon with a single Thunderbolt. It's been a while, but Ash is a hacker. Confirmed. Here we have a direct quote from Blaine after he returns Rhydon to its Pokeball. I'll have to choose a different Pokemon. Really? Well, I'm glad you clarified, because I thought you were going to send the bloody fainted Rhydon back out. Blaine sends out Magmar, which can levitate for no reason. Jeez, the anime writers really took liberties with this episode, didn't they? I'm surprised they haven't had Pikachu transform into a fucking racing car at this point. All right, in this scene, and it's very similar to the scene where Rhydon was using Fury Attack, but I've only just now realized this. So follow along, Pikachu is running to towards Magmar whilst dodging its fire punch. But if Magmar is stood still, surely Pikachu would be right up against Magmar after dodging only one or two punches, given the length of Magmar's arms and given the length of Pikachu's body. So does this mean that whilst Magmar is using fire punch over and over again, it's actually backing away from Pikachu as it does so? Blaine's Magmar is apparently scared of Pikachu. Pass it on. So bearing in mind that Rhydon, a ground type Pokemon that is supposed to be immune to electric type attacks, is absolutely absolutely battered by Pikachu's Thunderbolt, Magmar, a pure fire type Pokemon who is not immune to electric attacks, can block Thunderbolt by holding up its fist like that. What absolute bollocks. They are making this shit up as they go along. Brock reckons that Magmar is creating an air lens where the air around it heats up so much that it refracts electricity. Now listen, I don't know a lot about air lancers, so if you do know about them, feel free to educate me down in the comments. Because it sounds a lot to me like, let's make up a bunch of crap to write ourselves out of this situation because it's not like the children watching will understand anyway. Blaine tells his Magmar to use Fire Blast and Misty warns Ash that Fire Blast is the most powerful move a fire type Pokemon can learn. Is it now? That's quite interesting because just before Brock was saying that Fire Spin is the most powerful attack that Ninetales can learn, but what move can Ninetales learn via TM? Fire Blast, the move that Misty just said is the most powerful attack a Fire Pokemon can learn. Checkmate, Brock. And of course they leave us on a bloody cliffhanger. Pokemon mate, why are you blue balls in us like this? How can you expect 11 year old Liam to go to school without knowing if Pikachu's gonna be all right? Also, I take umbrage with the narrator asking, will Pikachu be turned to the world's cutest lava lamp? Mate, when living things are set on fire, they do not turn into lava lamps. They turn to ash. Much like Pikachu, who's about to turn to ash and go, mate, what the fuck do I do now? So that'll do it for my WTF moments for Pokemon Season 1, Episode 58. Riddle me this. Let me know your favourites and any that I missed down in the comments below. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. It really helps me out. Head over to twitch.tv forward slash AceTrainLiam for all of my live streams. And of course, use code Ace right now for 30% off G Fuel. But until next time, I'm Ace AceTrainLiam. Keep on training.